All right. Good morning, everyone. I think we're going to start. I realize it's an early start. Um, and thank you very much for those of you who are in the room for making it so early to this session to start today with us. My name is Florian Ostmann. I'm the head of AI governance and regulatory innovation at the Alan Turing Institute, which is the UK's National Institute for Data Science and AI. And it's a real pleasure to welcome you to this session today, which will be dedicated to thinking about AI standardization um, and the role that multi-stakeholder participation and international cooperation have to play to make AI standards a success. There's been quite a lot of discussion, um, of course, across many different sessions around AI over the last few days, including um, on AI governance in many different ways. And standards has come up in quite a few different contexts, but I don't believe there has been sort of a full session dedicated to um, standards in the sense that we will be looking at today, which is standards developed by formally recognized standards development organizations. We'll tell you a bit more about what we mean by that um, in a moment. And so we're really excited about the opportunity to sort of dive deeper into this particular topic, into the, the role that standards as a specific governance tool can play um, to ensure the responsible use and development of AI. And to do so in particular in relation to the principles that are at the core of IGF in terms of multi-stakeholder participation and international cooperation. I'll say a few words about the structure of the session. Um, we will begin with a presentation about an initiative that we launched in the UK just about a year ago. Um, that initiative is called the AI Standards Hub. Um, some of you may have heard about it before. It's a partnership between the Alan Turing Institute, the British Standards Institution, and the National Physical Laboratory in the UK working very closely with the UK government. Um, and it's an initiative de dedicated to awareness raising um, and increasing participation, capacity building around AI standardization. So we'll tell you a bit about how we set up the initiative, um, what the mission is, and also um, our plans and, and sort of interest to collaborate internationally um, with like-minded partners around these topics. And we'll then move on to a panel discussion um, we've got uh, four terrific speakers with us today um, from uh, different regions of the world to uh, join us on a reflect on these themes of multi-stakeholder participation and international cooperation in AI standards. And then we'll make sure to reserve some time at the end uh, for uh, sort of your participation, your thoughts um, uh, and, and questions that you may have. We will be using Mentimeter later on as an interactive exercise, but we will get to that later on. Um, we'll share the link for that when we get to it. And please do feel free uh, you know, throughout the session to use the chat function or the Q&A function to share any questions. We will monitor the chat and we will try our best to work any questions into the session as we move along. So with all of that said, um, we will start with the presentation. And for that, I'm joined by two colleagues, by Matilda Rode, um, who is the AI and cybersecurity sector lead at the British Standards Institution, which is the UK's national standards body, and uh, Sandeep Bandari, head of digital innovation at the National Physical Laboratory, which is the UK's Nas National Measurement Institute or Metrology Institute. So I'll pass over to them, and then I'll, I'll come back later. Matilda, over to you. Great. Thank you, Florian. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, it, it's great to, to see uh, so many of you here, and uh, thank you to those of us who are joining us online as well. Um, so the AI Standards Hub, um, as Florian has already introduced, um, has got two um, key missions. Um, the first is advancing the use of responsible AI, um, and that's by unlocking some of the particular benefits of standards as a governance mechanism. As Florian mentioned, this week we've heard a lot about regulation for AI, um, guidelines and frameworks, um, but um, in this session we're specifically focusing on standards, which is distinct um, from these other uh, regulatory um, mechanisms um, in the sense that standards are voluntary codes of um, conduct, uh, of representing best practice. Um, 
And the second mission of the Standards Hub is to empower stakeholders um, to become actively involved in the international AI standardization landscape, um, including participation in the development of standards and the informed use of published standards. Um, if you have attended any other sessions this week on how we can look at um, responsible AI practices, uh, you might find the landscape slightly overwhelming and the AI Standards Hub can hopefully be a tool to, to help navigate that space. Um, is anyone in the room uh, involved in the development of standards in any way, just out of interest? No, okay, great. Um, so there are several organizations behind the AI Standards Hub. We've heard Again, this week, um, I'm sure you've been to other sessions on the use of responsible AI, calls for tracing um, the data that's used in models, finding weaknesses, and making sure that they're reliable and not giving us uh, untrustworthy results. Many of these questions are actually still open research problems, and that's one of the reasons that the hub uh, brings together several organizations with different strengths. So the three um, that, that we're here representing today uh, that make up the hub are the Alan Turing Institute, which is the National Institute for Data Science and AI, so it's an academic research organization. Um, BSI, British Standards Institute, um, which is the national standards body that represents the UK uh, at ISO, the International Standards Organization, and the National Physical Laboratory, NPL, which is the National um, Metrology or Measurement, not Weather, Institute, um, which produces um, technical measurement standards, and these feed into the um, overall standards themselves. And this initiative has been supported um, by the UK government's Department for Science, Innovation and Technology. So um, international standards um, are governance tools which are developed by various um, standards organizations, some of which we've listed on the slide here. And if you aren't aware of the standards development landscape in AI, which hopefully by the end of uh, this session, uh, you, you will be more informed on that topic. You might have come across some of the most famous um, ISO standards, such as 27001 series on cybersecurity um, and 9001 on quality management. Um, and with, there is now a rapidly growing landscape of standards for AI. So we're anticipating the first ISO standard on AI to be published um, at the end of this year or perhaps beginning of next year. And there are many others in development, including um, on the use of sustainable AI, um, mitigation of bias in AI, and a very interesting um, standard to be published, uh, hopefully next spring or summer, 42006, on audit practices for AI, which will also be very interesting for um, compliance with the EU AI Act. So why standardization for AI um, versus, for example, regulation um, or framework? So regulation um, is obviously something that's supported um, by legal framework and um, organizations are required to comply, whereas standards are voluntary codes of best practice. But why would companies um, bother to adhere to these voluntary codes? Well, as you might have heard from some of the large organizations developing AI models this week, they've been developing their own internal codes of best practice, but each one of these are slightly different. If we can develop a standardized way of doing this, um, we can provide quality and safety assurance, um, inbuilt other goals like um, environmental targets or UN sustainable development goals. They can be used for um, ethical development, um, knowledge and technology transfer, and to provide interoperability between products. Ultimately, standards can help build trust between organizations and their consumers, and also along the supply chain, both in the supply chain that an organization is feeding into and the organizations um, that are feeding into your own supply chain. These can also um, provide market access by complying with certain trade requirements. They link into other government mechanisms um, and can also be used as a kind of pathway towards regulation as they are indeed in certain sectors, um, particularly for th things like medical devices, for example. So just because uh, we had a response in the room that, that oh, none of the audience has is, is been involved um, in standards development, I hope 
and th this is relevant information, that standards are voluntary for organisations to comply with. They're developed by committees, so they're not developed by standards bodies, and unlike regulation, which is um, developed by regulators, they're developed by experts in this area um, who are volunteers um, on a standards committee. And they're also developed by consensus two-thirds consensus, in case you're interested. There are also quite a lot of standards. Um, 3,000 standards, roughly, are produced every year by BSI, British Standards Institute, alone. Um, and again, I hope that the AI Standards Hub um, will be a useful tool um, for those of you who are looking to navigate this space um, with regards to AI. So not just the horizontal AI standards, um, which are general standards relating to AI, but also the ones that are sector specific because we have specific requirements in certain sectors. Now, because it's early in the morning, I thought it would be fun to do a quiz. Um, <laughs> and I wondered if anybody, uh, if these uh, uh, things on the board mean anything to anyone in the room. Don't be shy. Okay, good, yeah. I, I, <laughs> this again is a kind of indicator of the fact that there, there can be quite an overwhelming number of um, acronyms and numbers um, in the standards landscape, which uh, once you become familiar with using them, you find yourself using them all the time, um, but can make it quite impenetrable in the first place. Um, so 42,001, um, is the standard that we're expecting uh, to be published at the end of the year. It's currently an FDIS stage, which is final draft international standard. It means it's only out for editorial comments, and as long as there aren't too many of them, we're expecting it to be published um, in December or January. So this will be the first international standard published on AI, and it's an AI risk management system standard. Um, I already mentioned uh, 42006 um, on audit, which we expect next spring. Uh, JTC1 is the Joint Technical Committee 1, um, which um, is uh, the parent committee of subcommittee 42 can keep going on with these numbers, um, that uh, actually uh, developed uh, 42001, and then just showing how this maps down to the national level, ART1 is the relevant um, AI um, standards development committee within BSI. And in case you're interested on the ISO website, there's a lot of information about how many and which countries are involved in at each committee in, in the development of the standards. Um, so, so you can dig into that data. Uh, and with that, I'm going to hand back to Florian to tell you more about the hub. Thank you, Matilda. So with sort of that set out in terms of, you know, what kinds of standards we are focused on and, uh, you know, why we think those standards are important, um, let me tell you a bit more about um, the relationship between the Standards Hub and the UK's policy thinking on AI and then go into more detail on uh, how we developed our strategy and the kinds of challenges that we're trying to address with the Hub. So in terms of the policy context, and Nikita, um, who is joining us on the panel discussion, will we'll go into more detail later on. The, the main thing to mention is that uh, the UK government um, has, uh, over the last few years, um, gone through a process of thinking about the regulation of AI, but also more broadly, um, the regulation of uh, digital technologies in general. And throughout different pieces of uh, policy work, um, policy papers and policy statements, there's been a recognition of the role of standards um, as a governance tool for the reasons that Matilda mentioned, sort of the, the way in which standards are developed, the fact that they are open to input from all relevant stakeholder groups, the fact that they can be useful to support regulation in various ways or also to fill regulatory gaps where regulation doesn't exist. Um, so Nikita will say more about this, but essentially the hub um, is, is a deliverable that was uh, highlighted in the national AI strategy uh, that the UK, UK government published in September uh, 2021 and also um, plays an important role in the context of the recently published, um, uh, 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 that was about half a year ago in March uh, this year, the recently published AI regulation white paper. Now, the AI regulation white paper, um, at a very high level, um, just a few words about that, sets out a context-specific, risk-based, and decentralized regulatory approach. So what that means in practice is that uh, it's based on the view that uh, existing regulatory bodies are best placed to think about the implications of AI in their relevant regulatory remits, 
And uh, in order to sort of encourage and enable regulatory bodies to think about these implications, the White Paper sets out five guiding principles. Those principles are fairly familiar uh, to anyone, you know, familiar with AI governance. They resonate very closely with the OECD uh, AI principles, for example. So the White Paper sets out these five principles and then essentially um, sort of puts the, um, the task to regulators to think about the implementation of these principles in their remits and emphasizes the role of standards developed in SDOs in, in terms of facilitating that implementation. So in, in a sense, there's a, an important link between the objectives of the regulatory approach and the uh, role of standards in the sense that standards are seen as facilitating the implementation of principles, providing that the detail that is needed um, to, to make those principle, principles meaningful and in a given context, in a given regulatory remit. Now, moving on to sort of the challenges uh, that we're trying to address with the hub. Um, as Matilda mentioned, standards um, in the organizations that we are focused on are developed through a process that is open to all stakeholder groups. And we know that in the AI space, there are lots of different stakeholder groups you know, whose interests are affected or whose views are relevant to the development of standards. And that it includes, of course, different actors in the AI supply chain, so developers, procurers, users. But it also includes uh, stakeholders outside of industry. It includes, uh, importantly, civil society and consumer perspectives. It also includes regulators and academic researchers. And while the standards development process is open to all of those groups, we know historically that not all of these groups are equally strongly represented in, in those processes. And so to give some examples, um, civil society voices we know are less strongly represented compared to other voices, compared to industry, for example. And within industry, um, SMEs and startups, for example, are less strongly represented compared to larger companies. So. At the core of the mission of the AI Standards Hub and the reason for setting it up isn't just the recognition of the importance of AI standards, but it's also the recognition that in order for AI standards to be effective and fit for purpose, it's really important that all of those stakeholder perspectives are included in the development of standards. And what we're trying to do with the Hub is to help, sta help all of those stakeholder groups, and especially those who have less experience in the space, to um, develop the knowledge, develop the skills and the understanding um, and also perhaps the coordination that's needed to achieve that involvement. Um, in terms of what sort of the key groups are, I think I mentioned them already. So in the private sector, it includes larger and smaller companies, includes civil society, consumer groups, regulatory bodies, academia. And then, of course, there are people who are already actively involved in standards committees. Uh, those are also key because they can, of course, play an important role in guiding others and, and sharing information about that work. We did a fair amount of stakeholder engagement leading up to the launch of the hub. So we were very mindful of, you know, making sure that we de develop an initiative and, and develop a shape for the initiative that meets actual needs rather than just developing something in the abstract for which there isn't a need. Um, and so we did several engagement roundtables and surveys with each relevant stakeholder groups. Um, and you know, one of the things we tested at the outset, um, of course, was you know, is there a recognition of, of the importance of standards and what's the current level of awareness and engagement in the space? And as this slide shows, um, you know, there's more detailed data, but just at a, at a high level to give you a sense, is really that across all groups, you know, there was a strong recognition that standards are going to be key for AI governance. Um, and there is significant thinking in each group about AI standardization, but there is a clear gap, as you can see, between the perceived importance of the topic and the extent of current thinking. And that sort of, you know, awareness gap and to some extent also capability gap um, um, in, in thinking about standards is what we're trying to address. We then um, try to dig a bit deeper and, and sort of, you know, explore with stakeholder groups, what are the challenges? What's holding you back? You know, what, what explains that gap? What's holding you back in engaging with AI standardization? And at a high level, there were sort of four key areas that came out of that part of the engagement. The first one 
um, is a perceived lack of easily accessible information around AI standards. That includes understanding, keeping track of which standards are being developed and published, but then also identifying those standards that are most relevant um, to a given uh, user or stakeholder. Secondly, the skills needed to contribute to standards development or engage with standards once they are published. So there, you know, there's a strong sense that both the process of development, developing standards can be quite complex and you need knowledge and skills to navigate that process. But then, of course, also knowledge about what does best practice for AI look like? You know, what does a good standard look like? What should I be contributing if I am on a committee um, and contribute to drafting a standard? So skills, the second area. Thirdly, securing organizational buy-in um, for engagement. So we know that um, engagement with standards development can be time-consuming. Um, how do I convince my organization um, you know, that that's a worthwhile thing to do, um, given that they're computing resource priorities? Um, uh, and that's sort of relevant, of course, especially for those types of organizations who are historically less involved in this space. And then fourthly, a uh, need for analysis and strategic direction. So the, given the fact, and I'll say more about this in a moment, that there is such a vast number of AI-related standards already being developed, um, you know, which are the areas that are most important? Um, are there gaps that need to be addressed, standards that are missing? Um, and, and yeah, a, a need for strategic direction in, in shaping AI standardization. So those were the challenges, and we then, in shaping the strategy, essentially translated those challenges in four different pillars of activity that the hub is pursuing. The first pillar is what we're calling the observatory. Um, that can be found on our website, um, and that consists of two databases. One is a database on AI standards, um, and the other one is a database on AI-related policies from around the world. Uh, community collaboration is around organizing events, uh, virtual events, in-person events, to engage the community, and bring stakeholders together around conversations um, to, to gather input into standards that are under development, to identify priorities and needs, and so on. Knowledge and training, that's where we've developed a suite of e-learning materials that can be found on our website, but we're also um, offering in-person training events, um, virtual ones and uh, in-person ones. Um, and then fourthly, research and analysis, um, that's sort of a more traditional research function where the hub pursues research to develop insights to address these needs for strategic direction and analysis. I would like to say just a bit more about um, each pillar and in particular the observatory and within the observatory the AI standards database because that's in a way the resource that uh, you know sort of took the most um, thinking in terms of how we develop it um, and, and how it should be designed. So the Observatory for AI Standards is a database on our website that tracks um, both standards under development and standards that have already been published for AI. Uh, you can see a breakdown on the slide um, for how these standards are distributed across different categories. Um, the key thing here is that it's a really a large number already, so over 300 relevant standards um, that are captured in the database. Um, a large number of standards that are already published. Um, and uh, what sort of was key in designing the database is to, to make it easier to navigate that vast number of standards. So we have developed a, a range of different filter categories, uh, a search function, and so on. We also have interactive features. It's possible to follow a standard, um, in which case you get updates um, when a standard moves from one development phase to the next, for example. Um, you can let other community members know if you have been involved in the development of standards so they can reach out to you and uh, try to find out more. Um, and then there is a, a discussion thread and also a opportunity to leave reviews for a standard um, that you have, may have used or that you may have been involved with. In terms of the other pillars, I'll keep this very brief, but uh, you will find more information on all of this on our website. Um, so on the community collaboration pillar, um, over the last 12 months we had a series of events. Um, those are to a large extent recorded and you will be able to find recordings on our events page if you're interested. Some of that was focused on transparent and explainable AI as a specific topic. Others was more generally focused on trustworthy AI. 
there was targeted engagement with certification bodies. Um, and then we also have a standing forum for UK regulators where um, regulators have a space to come together among themselves um, as, a, as a single stakeholder group to um, exchange knowledge around the role that standards can play in AI regulation. For knowledge and training, as I mentioned, um, that includes various e-learning materials. Uh, there's sort of a snapshot of some examples on this slide. If you're interested, uh, we'd like to invite you to take a look at that on the website. And uh, the same is the case for research and analysis. This is just a snapshot of, of some of the most recent pieces, but more of, you know, more of that and more details you'll be able to find on the website. That concludes the uh, sort of the summary of what we have been up to so far and why we set up the AI Standards Hub. And I'll now pass on to Sunny to um, tell us more about uh, our objectives and our interest to collaborate um, internationally. Brilliant. Thank you, uh, Florian. And uh, good morning to everybody in the room. And uh, good afternoon and good evening to uh, those online as well. Um, so my name is Sunny, and I'm from the National Physical Laboratory and a part of this uh, amazing collaboration that we've set up. And uh, I'll talk a bit more about what the collaboration is and uh, what our aspirations are and why we have those objectives and aspirations. Um, so we're seeing, we've heard a lot over the last few days about the growing need for standards to help with governance, with uh, assessment. And... Uh, so heard about many different challenges. So on the screen you can see uh, several different uh, initiatives, development of uh, policies and strategies. But actually even just yesterday I heard about uh, some work going on in Africa where across the continent there are at least 25 initiatives and around 466 different policies in development and so we've got all of this environment out there in the world where lots of countries, lots of uh, regional organizations are working to do all of this work. And we've really seen that the world recognizes the importance of standards. So um, if we draw out just one of those examples with the recently uh, published EU AI Act, um, we can see that um, uh, the support, the development, the creation of the confirmation, uh, conf conform conf conformity to standards, uh, to do that most nations have something called a quality infrastructure which tends to be built up of uh, a few different organizations, which include organizations such as myself, which is the technical measurement standards, and then the national standards body, such as uh, the British Standards Institute, and then other organizations that actually uh, check the conformity and compliance, as well as accredit organizations. So our hub is an example of how bringing these can be a valuable um, exercise in itself because it helps with uh, a diverse set of uh, skills, capacity building, as well as looking at the entire ecosystem or that value chain in the whole together at the same time. But how do we lift that from a national paradigm to an international paradigm? These standards have to be um, worked in by consensus and we all have shared challenges and globally we're all at various stages of our domestic journeys. So how do we bring everyone around the world to the same level and work on our shared global challenges to truly realize the benefits of AI, as well as provide that confidence to us as normal people, as the public, to have in this technology and really benefit from it. So here on the screen, you see some of the role of standards within the EU AI Act, where we've taken, they've taken five principles and then uh, set out seven essential requirements within a high-risk system or high-risk systems. And so the European Commission has requested Sentinel-Elect to now develop standards around 10 issues to really try and harmonize these standards, which then pr make this presumption of um, legal conformity. Now, as I said, these, things, uh, these standards are generally voluntary. So how can we work on these together such that everyone is on that same level platform? So we really are trying to do this. And on the screen, you just see three small examples of some of the things that we have in train. Uh, in addition, we have had much international interest and really uh, pleasing the reach out we've had from north, south, east and west. And so we're partners with the OECD and uh, we cross-reference with their tools and metrics for trustworthy AI and uh, they also cross-reference with the hub. Uh, we're also doing a lot of work with uh, NIST and other like-minded organizations. Um, to put that into a bit of context, um, NIST is the American equivalent, or NPL is the British equivalent of uh, each other, and there are 100 different organizations of this around the world which are signatories to the 1875 Meter Convention. So there is already certain platforms to do this work. Now, assessment, for example, is expressly a measurement activity. 
how can we all understand and make those measurements? How would you actually measure the trustworthiness of something quantitatively? Also appreciating that AI is very context specific, so now there is a new paradigm where we also have to think about qualitative assessment and measurements. And then another example we have here is where some of the work we're working with other national standards bodies around the world. And in this case, we've pulled out the bilateral work going on with Canada at the moment. And again, it's not limited to just Canada. We're working with many other countries. Next slide, please, Florian. And so broadly, these are the kinds of things that people are asking us to think about and do. So how do we build these international stakeholder networks? Uh, there is a big challenge out there in the world that Every region is lacking the skills, the resources, the people, the knowledge in these things. So how do we bring the right people together to share, uh, to address these shared challenges? And so, as talked about several times already, it's about bringing the national standards bodies together with the national measurement institutes, bringing the right academic prowess into the room. And most importantly, why are we doing this and who are we doing this for? We've been asked to help and work with others on collaborative research and then also developing these shared resources. So lifting up from the national paradigm to the international paradigm. And so Florian's already shown some screenshots uh, of the platform. Next slide, please. And what we'd really like to, I'd like to finish off this part is, um, this is not just a UK resource. This is available, anybody can access this. So please come have a look. And if there's anything there of interest and you would really like to work on shared challenges, then please get in touch. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Sunny. So that brings us to the end of the presentation part of our session. Um, as I mentioned um, earlier, uh, we do have sort of an interactive exercise that we've prepared um, and that we'd like to come back to um, towards the end. Um, we'll do that using Mentimeter. And so before we move on to the uh, panel discussion, I'd like to invite you all, uh, both those of you in the room and those of you joining online, to take a moment to go to Mentimeter um, and then in your own time um, sort of complete the uh, questions that, that you will see on your screen that come up. Um, it's not a big exercise, so don't worry. Um, also worth mentioning that it's completely anonymous, um, but I think there will be some interesting uh, results that we can look at um, when we get to the discussion later on. So to get to Mentimeter, you can either go to menti.com and enter this code. Um, my colleague Anna will also put the chat for uh, Mentimeter, uh, sorry, the link for Mentimeter into the chat. Um, so you can just click there um, or you can try to scan the QR code um, if that works for you. So we'll just take a moment. Um, I'll leave the slide on for a a short moment, um, and the link is now in the chat as well um, before we move on. Great. I think I'll, I'll stop sharing the slide, but um, the uh, link um, uh, for the uh, uh, Mentimeter is in the chat, so I hope everyone will be able to, to access that there. Um, let me move on uh, to introducing our panel. As I mentioned, uh, we're very excited to be joined by um, a great panel of experts today um, with a vast amount of experience in the AI standard space um, from across different regions of the world. Um, and also Nikita Bangu, um, our colleague from the UK government, um, uh, who will tell us a bit more about sort of the, the context um, in, in the UK policy uh, uh, field. Um, so I will stop sharing the slide and I'd like to invite our panelists to um, Turn on the cameras. Fantastic. Um, Nikita um, is joining us here on the stage, so it'd be great if you could move the camera such that we are both visible. Um, <laughs> Nikita is sitting to the right of me. Um, and I'll just briefly introduce, introduce our panelists. So I'll start with, with Nikita. Nikita Bangu is the head of digital standards policy in the UK government's Department for Science, Innovation and Technology. Uh, she works in the digital standards team in the department, which brings together the UK government's global engagement with key internet governance and digital standards bodies. 
and she works on digital standards policy portfolio, which includes a standards policy um, on new and emerging technologies such as AI and other areas such as quantum technologies. So welcome, Nikita. Thank you for joining us. Um, Ashley Kazovan, um, next on the panel, is uh, the executive director of the Responsible AI Institute, which is a multi-stakeholder nonprofit dedicated to mitigating harm and unintended consequences of AI systems. Ashley has been at the forefront of building tools and policy interventions to support the responsible use and adoption of uh, AI and other technologies. Um, she'll tell us more about that, including uh, her important work and the Institute's important work on certification. And previously, Ashley uh, led the development of the first major AI-related government policy instrument in Canada, which is the Directive on Automated Decision-Making Systems. Welcome, Ashley, and thank you for taking the time to join us. Um, Wan Si Lee is the Director of Data-Driven Tech at Singapore's Infocom Media Development Authority. In the area of AI, Wan Si's Responsibilities include driving Singapore's approach to AI governance, growing the trustworthy AI ecosystem in Singapore, and collaborating with governments around the world to further the development of responsible AI. She is also responsible for encouraging greater use of emerging data technologies, such as privacy-enhancing tech, um, to enable more trusted data sharing in Singapore. Welcome, Wansi, and thank you for joining. And then, last but not least, um, we have Aurélie Chaquet, who is an independent consultant advising ASX20 companies on the responsible implementation of AI. Aurélie also works as a principal research consultant at uh, CSIRO Data61, which is uh, part of Australia's National Science Agency. And she leads global initiatives on the impl implementation of, of responsible AI in various areas. And one piece that's particularly worth highlighting, which again we'll hear more about, is uh, Aurelie's role in chairing Australia's National Committee for Standardization um, for AI, which represents Australian views um, with, uh, within ISO and uh, the development of AI standards um, in ISO. Welcome, Aurelie, and thank you. Great, so with those introductions uh, done, um, let's move on to the first round of questions. And I would like to start um, with you, Nikita, um, from a sort of a UK perspective. Um, I mentioned earlier, you know, at a very high level, um, what the relationship between the hub and the wider policy thinking and government uh, has been and is. But it'd be great to hear from you a bit more about um, how policy thinking in DCIT um, uh, relates to the hub, what, what are the ideas that led to the creation of the hub, um, and why does the UK, the UK government think um, that this is an important initiative? Sure, thank you, Florian, and good morning to all of those in the room, and good afternoon and evening to those online as well. Um, as Florian mentioned, I'm Nikita Bangu, and I'm the UK government representative on the panel today. Um, so, I mean, Florian, uh, Matilda and Sunny uh, provided a great overview of what the AI Standards Hub does. I guess just to provide a bit more context from the UK government um, perspective um, and our policy thinking there, um, I'll just run you through kind of our approach to standards and how we've embedded that into our um, AI policy governance as well. So. Um, I guess to start with, um, it's just to note that the UK government sees um, standards as, uh, a, a as many benefits in kind of AI standards and engaging in the standardization landscape. Um, in our recent um, AI white paper, which sets out our approach to regulating AI policy more broadly, uh, we noted the importance that standards and other tools such as um, assurance techniques can play within the wider AI governance uh, framework as well and can help sort of implement uh, some of the approaches from um, the UK government's approach on AI policy as well. Um, the paper sort of recognizes that digital standards are not an end to themselves. They are a means of making uh, the technology work and really important to consider sort of the wider toolkit um, um, that we have within our regulation and governance approach to AI as well. Um, under the UK presidency of the G7, we also looked into digital standards with our um, G7 and like-minded colleagues as well and set up um, the collaboration on digital technical standards as well to kind of note 
uh, the importance of working together uh, within the space and recognizing the benefits that standards have within the wider AI policy regulatory framework. I think having said that in terms of the benefits of AI standards, we also recognize that there, it is a very complex space. There are, um, from speaking to our stakeholders and through sort of our um, research and collaboration with international partners, we recognize that there are many barriers in place um, in participating in the AI standardization ecosystem. So as UK government, we were really keen to sort of work with our stakeholders and our international partners to reduce these benefits so that standards can be for all, uh, whether it's from knowing what standards are and how to adopt them into your business to kind of encouraging that multi-stakeholder global approach um, to developing standards and providing um, all groups with the opportunities and toolkits they need to participate in this ecosystem as well. Um, you would have heard a lot at the IGF today of the importance of um, collaboration and multi-stakeholder approach to digital technologies. That's exactly the same for standards, um, which um, it's, it's, it's quite difficult to do because as I mentioned, it is quite complex. Um, many people have been, um, many people who develop standards have been playing sort of in that game for, for many years. So it's, there is kind of a need to sort of support our stakeholders there to sort of help, um, help get them in those um, organizations and really understanding what standards are. So I guess through um, consulting with our stakeholders, we identified the key challenges um, in the UK, which um, uh, Florian went through in the presentation just now. Um, we kind of thought about how we can kind of intervene in that market to support um, our stakeholders in reducing those barriers to enable um, the benefits of, of AI standards uh, uh, to seep through. Um, some of our key um, aims for um, kind of setting up the AI standards hub and doing that work was to um, increase the adoption and awareness of standards, um, to create um, clear synergies between AI governance and standards, and sort of our work with the AI white paper and setting out the role for AI uh, standards as a tool for trustworthy AI, and also to provide practical tools for stakeholders to understand and engage in the uh, standards ecosystem. So that really was our thinking behind setting up the AI Standards Hub and uh, sort of working with um, our key experts in, in the field, bringing together parts of the UK National uh, Quality Infrastructure, British Standards Institute uh, and National Physical Laboratory and our National AI Centre to bring the minds together so that we can uh, uh, reach a wide uh, user base um, um, in the UK and beyond to, to help uh, facilitate um, um, the redu reduction of barriers we've seen in this place. Um, the AI Standards Hub has been running uh, for a year now. I think next week it's the first birthday of the AI Standards Hub, uh, which is great. Uh, and we've seen lots of success um, in this space um, over the past year. Um, we're looking to increase our international collaboration with the AI Standards Hub in the coming years. I'm really keen to uh, uh, follow up on the on this conference and partic participate with you more in that space as well. Um, I think the last thing I, I would just note is that we, um, UK government, uh, con commissioned an independent evaluation of the pilot phase of the hub, which was the first six months of the hub, to just um, to understand sort of what's worked well um, and how we can con continue growing. Um, we will be publishing that evaluation, so. Um, it, it will be on our gov.uk website, so accessible for all to look at. Um, but some early findings really indicate that the hub has um, helped uh, support the UK uh, community in understanding what AI standards are. Um, we conducted a survey and found 70% um, 70, 70 of respondents um, kind of noted that the hub is really helping in, in building that knowledge gap um, and sort of inspiring and motivating them to get more involved in the development organizations, which is great to see. I'll stop there. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Nikita, for adding that, that context. And, and yeah, um, it's exciting that we're approaching the one-year anniversary. <laughs> Thanks for mentioning that. Um, great. So we'll now uh, move on sort of to the international perspectives. Um, and uh, but if I didn't make it explicit earlier, so it, the, the great thing about the panel is that we will have sort of, you know, perspectives from Canada and the US, so North America, that's Ashley's focus, um, and then Van C from Singapore and Aurelie's experience in Australia. It would be great to hear how 
um, you know, some of the themes that we, we shared uh, resonate with, uh, you know, your experiences in, in, in those countries. Um, so I, I essentially like as a first round ask each of you roughly the same question, which is um, how does what we've presented uh, so far, um, and, and of course you've heard about the AI Standards Hub uh, previously, um, the challenges that we're trying to address, the kind of initiative that we've built, how does that resonate with you know, what you see in terms of AI standardization priorities and challenges in your countries. Uh, I know that, uh, you know, in some cases there are initiatives that are quite similar or comparable in nature, at least overlapping. Um, and perhaps we can start with you, Ashley. Um, you know, one such initiative um, is, is the Data and AI Standards Collaborative um, that you are heavily involved in. So it'd be great to hear a bit more about that and also more generally your, your reflections on, on this space. Yes, thank you so much. And thanks for having us here uh, to present about the work that we're doing. And also, I think just establishing this really important conversation related to uh, AI standards. I think it's, as you've mentioned, uh, becoming a more important discussion, or at least one that more people are reflecting on, given the connection to uh, different types of regulations. Uh, however, it still seems to be a very confusing topic because standards can mean so many different things. Uh, ironically, standards are not standard. And so there's a lot of different uh, points in which, uh, or entry points, I guess, into that conversation and understanding why they're being established for what purpose uh, is something that we're trying to reflect on in the Canadian context. Uh, as Florian's mentioned, I am heavily involved in an initiative uh, that's been established by the Canadian government uh, called the uh, Data and AI Standards Collaborative, and I'm the co-chair of that representing civil society. And in this capacity, uh, we've been really trying to understand the implications of AI systems and the, the data that feeds uh, into those and really trying to bring together civil society, academia, uh, and government uh, agencies to reflect on what types of standards are needed. Um, really, really similar in nature to uh, what you've already heard from the Standards Hub. And uh, one of the things that we're quite interested in doing as part of this initiative is trying to identify different types of specific use cases, again, kind of aligned to the pillars that uh, Florian presented on previously, and understand the context-specific standards that are required uh, within, uh, within the whole value chain of a, uh, an AI system. And I guess what I'll say in addition to that is maybe because I'm here to represent the North American piece, but I do not uh, speak on behalf of NIST, uh, but because it was mentioned earlier, uh, we're starting to see a lot of uptake in tools in the North American market uh, that is related to some of the work that is happening in these national government uh, activities. So Florian uh, earlier spoke about uh, NIST's AI RMF, uh, the risk management framework, and what we're starting to see through this initiative, um, OECD, et cetera, is the work through these multi-stakeholder forums to be able to establish good uh, baseline initiatives for standards to be developed from. So that could be things like um, even just what does the life cycle of an AI system look like? What are the different types of definitions that we should be using for these systems and have some commonality amongst those? Um, because what we'd like to get into then uh, more deep uh, from a Canadian data and AI standards collaborative perspective is, uh, as I said, back to those use cases, understanding what types of certifications, standards, uh, mechanisms are required for both the evaluation of a quality management system that uh, Nikita spoke to earlier that we're seeing with 42001, uh, and then what is needed at a product level, which is work that we're doing at the Responsible AI Institute, which I'll, I'm sure I'll speak to after. And then, uh, and then looking also to uh, individual certification. And this is something that Orly, I'm sure, will address as it's something that she's been quite interested in for a while in terms of what does individual training look like. And so when I mention these uh, different types of standards that are needed, uh, there's really uh, a breadth 
that we're we're needing to look at. So I'll leave it there and uh, uh, just really happy to be here and have this discussion at an international forum like this. Great, thank you very much, Ashley, and, and we'll come back to some of those uh, points later. Um, moving on uh, to you, Wansi, um, similar question for you. How, you know, what, what, how, how does sort of the, the points around the importance of standards, but also the challenges, how does that resonate with your work and your, your experience in Singapore? And I, I believe, you know, there's an initiative that's quite relevant from your perspective that's um, uh, Verify, the Verify initiative, be great to hear a bit more about that, and then your, your sort of views on standardization more broadly. Thanks, Lauren. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Wan Si uh, from Singapore. I'm from the Singapore government. Um, thanks for having me um, on the panel this morning. Um, it's uh, really interesting to be able to talk about standards with uh, like-minded uh, folks from around the world. Um, one of the things that um, we recognize in Singapore, for us in Singapore, it's very important is the need for international cooperation. So that's something um, when Sunny talked about just now, something that really resonated as well. Um, so international cooperation can be done in various ways. Of course, uh, Singapore is an active member uh, in the ISO process. Um, so we participate um, and we contribute and we vote and so on. Um, but at the same time, uh, we do not just leave it at the ISO kind of um, level of cooperation. We also work quite closely with um, countries and we also participate actively in the multilateral platforms. So maybe just as an example, since um, I actually spoke about NIST um, and that was also brought up in the earlier presentation, um, the NIST AIRMF, um, um, coming from um, the US is something that many organizations will be looking at. And then for us, and what's important then is how then do we, our own work in Singapore, uh, map to, or how do we work together with what this has already uh, published. So we very actively uh, started a, a mapping um, project with NIST. Uh, we developed a, a crosswalk um, where we um, sort of looked at what we've done in Singapore in terms of our guidelines for AI Verify, um, model AI governance framework um, that we have published a couple of years ago. Um, and then we did the mapping exercise then to see where we are aligned and where we're different. And of course, in, in, at, this, at this level, uh, we've gone to some level of detail. Um, even at the level of details, um, there are many similarities and um, quite, a, quite a lot of alignment. We find that this work is very helpful um, for organizations or companies that are operating internationally um, because it's, uh, because they want to make sure that this what they are doing um, in terms of implementing the right you know practices and so on for responsible AI um, it is aligned both it, um, to Singapore's requirements um, as well as some of the standards work that's happening um, in the US so that's why we started that process of NIST um, and of course then extending that then we we're, we're, we're looking at other um, standards that are being developed um, through ISO since and the like and so on and to see how we can align as well. So that's that's one example of how we can cooperate internationally and how we can make sure that there's at least some kind of alignment or interoperability between the kind of, or amongst the kind of um, guidelines and standards that have been developed. Um, the other area that resonated is the need for multi-stakeholder um, engagement. Um, of course, there are platforms to do that. ISO is one platform. Our, our own um, Singapore standards um, work is also another platform. But I thought, as Florian mentioned, I'll highlight one of the things that we're doing that's a little bit different, um, just, just to show that there are, there are many alternatives out there. Um, so uh, besides you know, guidelines, uh, requirements um, that the Singapore government sets out, uh, we also wanted to make sure that organizations are able to demonstrate um, um, adherence or compliance to some of these guidelines. Right? Um, so we developed um, the AI Verify um, the testing framework and toolkit. Um, so it's a set of detailed requirements on how then we think about um, validating um, responsible AI practices or implementation of uh, responsible AI um, requirements um, when, when organizations implement AI systems. So quite a lot of detailed um, process checks, for example, um, align again to international principles. We looked at requirements from around the world. We looked at principles from OECD and so on. And then we defined that into a set of testing requirements. At the same time, we also identify how do we test, right? It's, it's not just about process checks, but also how do you actually test the system? Um, so we developed a toolkit looking at some of the work that's already been done by academics around the world, as well as some of uh, the work that's been done by um, companies and, and, and put together a toolkit 
um, to test for um, fairness, explainability, and robustness, because those are things that we think we can test um, at this stage. And that, and but we also recognize that um, um, testing capability continues to evolve, and and there are many gaps. Um, so people around the world are, are working on different aspects. Um, that's why then we decided for AI Verify um, testing framework and toolkit to open source it. That's one. Uh, but not only to open source it so that people can contribute, but also created a foundation, an open source foundation to support the uh, contribution and engagement of um, organizations, developers, individuals um, around the world to, um, to build up AI Verify um, toolkit and um, framework. Um, even as we look at generative AI, for example, um, that's something then that needs to be extended um, for AI Verify, and that's why we feel it's important um, to work with the global community and the open source foundation is one way in which you can get multi-stakeholder involvement um, in technical development, um, as well as um, um, sharing of knowledge and um, experiences in the space of AI governance testing. Um, so that's one kind of slightly different take on how we um, take on multi-stakeholder engagement approach. Yep. Thanks. I'll just pause here for that. Thanks. That's great. Thank you, Vansi. And, and it would be great to come back uh, later, you know, in the next round and, and go into a bit more detail, both on sort of priorities for international collaboration and the multi-stakeholder involvement. But um, before going into more depth, um, let's move on to you, Aurelie, sort of for your general take, you know, on, on this topic. Um, you, of course, has a, have a lot of hands-on experience, you know, probably the most hands-on experience in relation to standards, given your role as the Australian committee chair. Um, so it would simply be great to hear, you know, from your vantage point, um, what's your take on, uh, on AI standardization, both in terms of importance, uh, challenges and, and sort of the international cooperation and multi-stakeholder angle. Thank you, Florian, and again, delighted to be here in this forum and talking about standards and certification. This is uh, my favorite topic. Um, to your point, uh, I'd like to maybe go back in time and uh, remind that actually back in 2017 already, um, the UN published, uh, th there was a few papers, academic papers that were published on, on standards at the time, explaining how they can be used as an agile, agile tool for international governance. Um, so now that the standards are, are mature um, and we see a lot more published, there's increased interest. From my perspective, I actually um, led Australia active participation in the standards. So. Um, my motivation uh, was actually, I come from the um, global markets, uh, financial services, and I saw the many crash that had happened. Um, we had to, uh, we had an onset of regulation that came after the GFC. And at the time, um, from a compliance perspective, um, the thought was, we really need um, some set of best practice um, that we can provide to industry in order to um, ensure that the onsets of regulation <laughs> um, is uh, industry informed. So that was a strong motivation for us to actually make the submission um, to standards and ISOs for Australia to actively participate and uh, shape the international standard on AI. So that was uh, uh, our entry into that world back in 2018. And as I said, the, the, the core business case is Australia is a small country um, and it really needs to um, actively participate in a topic and a regulate, uh, in the involvement of best practice that uh, for AI that is effectively uh, an international that's got an international Remy. So we had a, a roadmap already in 2020 um, for AI standards that had already focused on 42001. You'll hear that number a lot from me. That's the AI management system standard. And this is uh, what we describe here as a crown of the jewels of standards because it provides for the certification 
uh, of AI systems. So this was one key of a uh, part of our roadmap, obviously also as part um, of the work that I do with CSIRO, Data61 and the National AI Center in Australia. Um, this was one challenge is often standards, they are embedded everywhere in our life, but they're not visible and often organizations are not aware of them. So we started also in Australia through the National AI Center and through the Responsible AI Network, um, which is a community um, of um, where we get the best practice uh, with a community of experts. We that's got five pillars, uh, sorry, seven pillars, including standards. We are started to uh, develop education program uh, that also co that covers best practice, including AI standards. Um, so the, the initial um, course that we developed were on what are standards and how they're part of um, our daily life and how they're relevant for AI. And of course, the AI management system standards, what's coming, what's uh, likely to become uh, the standards that will enable uh, audit of those AI systems. Um, uh, with CSIRO, uh, Data61, we're also building tools, uh, a set of tools that are leveraging standards work. And um, you see in, in a day-to-day -day as part uh, of adoption in Australia of standards, we've already got the New South Wales AI Assurance Framework that actually is leveraging standards to provide assurance for AI system used by the government. This has been made mandatory for all um, uh, public services in New South Wales. If they're using AI, they have to go through that AI assurance framework. And um, obviously from a business perspective, there's definitely some uh, appeal. We see increased appeal in looking at standards that um, are starting to, um, to, that have effectively over 60 countries that are involved in developing them, but also um, that, um, let's say, Sensenelec and the EU Commission have been interested uh, from the beginning. We had the EU Commission coming to our ISO meeting from 2018 onwards. So, so that's why we see our governments already, um, even at the federal government, we had also some guidance uh, about chat GPT and generative AI provided, and that referenced some of our standards on bias uh, and others. So, so there's been a good uptake from that perspective in Australia. And I finish with uh, um, international initiatives that we have initiated. Also, we, um, we stand in Australia, we have um, developed a workshop that we delivered at the APEC SOM explaining how effectively AI standards can help really, uh, how standards can help scale uh, AI um, and what has uh, the benefit for organization in different states. But to your point, Florian, there's still this challenge of getting the, the standards well known. So they're no longer, they're, they're much more visible and increased participation. But really this is um, standards so far as proven, as I said, from the beginning as a very good agile tool for international governance. Great, thank you very much for that overview, Aurélie. And I think that was a really good segue um, to the next round of questions. Um, so, you know, we ended on the challenges and the more work that needs to be done. Um, and I'd like to basically to two, two rounds, you know, on each of the topics uh, for, for the session. So the first one on multi-stakeholder engagement and then the second one on international uh, collaboration. Let's start with multi-stakeholder involvement. So. Um, of course, standardization is already, you know, compared to other governance mechanisms, um, a very, uh, of, you know, inclusive uh, mechanism, right? I mean, it's, you know, contrasts with regulatory uh, rulemaking, for example, in that the process is open to, to all stakeholder groups in, in, in principle. But we are aware, as we mentioned at the beginning, that not all groups are equally represented. So it would be great to hear from all of you, and we'll start with Nikita. Um, you know, what do you see as the main challenges? What are the main obstacles um, for achieving um, you know, equitable involvement from all groups? And also, what are the most promising strategies for addressing 
uh, those challenges. So what can be done, including what can be done collaboratively at the international level to ensure and increase uh, stakeholder inclusion. Sure, thanks Florian. Um, so I'll start with uh, some of the main challenges. I mean, we covered it a pre a previously in terms of sort of what the UK sees as some of the challenges, but just to kind of uh, point to a few of the key ones. Um, for the UK in particular, um, it's sort of that um, um, ensuring we have the right representation at relevant um, standards development organisations. Uh, we're seeing quite a few uh, large companies, for example, uh, representing industry at a uh, standards development organisation, which is, of course, great in terms of providing that view. However, for the UK, most of our technology companies are you know, small to medium enterprises as well, who often um, are quite uh, you know, small companies and may not have a large regulatory team or standards experts um, who have the skill set needed to, um, to engage um, effectively in the standards development organization. So that's, um, we recognize that as a key challenge in terms of um, um, our uh, small to medium enterprises as well. Um, I think for us as well, another key stakeholder group um, is civil society, which has uh, sort of always been a bit of a quite challenging to, to get the resourcing and the expertise into standards development organizations as well. And I guess, you know, Florian just mentioned the key point of the standards are for everyone and standards are at the um, sort of offset providing those building blocks for how technology will be developed. So it's crucial that all stakeholder groups are taken in mind um, when developing these standards. I think another key challenge for UK government particularly is um, the issue of, um, you know, government is another key uh, stakeholder and kind of expertise to get in the state standards development organisations. For, for us, we have a very, very small technical team uh, within our digital uh, department uh, back in London, um, which um, Obviously, their resources can only stretch so much. So, getting that those viewpoints and that coordination um, across sort of constrained resourcing is, is another challenge. Um, one thing we're doing in the UK government at the moment is uh, thinking about talent pipeline as well. Um, you know, at the trying to increase diversity uh, presently, but also in the future, um, uh, working uh, with standards development organisations and other. Um, international partners to create um, um, sort of the next generation, I guess you can call it, of, of standards development organizations, uh, uh, developers as well. Um, I know there's a lot of work going on in this space already. The, I think BSI do quite, uh, our national standards body do quite a lot in that space. And uh, the IEC has the Young Professional Program as well to, to sort of, again, provide that career route and, and continue continuation of of skill sets into uh, the standards organization as well. Um, one thing um, particularly relevant for the IGF is that we're also working with the, the MAG, the multi advisory group to sort of embed digital standards within, the, within that thinking as well. So again, using international fora to, um, to, to promote that view of multi-stakeholder and um, um, the tools that we can develop together to get different voices in standards development organizations as well. Great, thank you, Nikita. Um, Ashley, over to you. How, how does that resonate with you in terms of you know, your views on obstacles and also solutions for um, ensuring inclusion and, and participation of stakeholders? Yeah, I think all of that resonates uh, here as well. I, I think one of the challenges that we're actually having with the Data and AI um, Standards Collaborative is that we're trying to be incredibly inclusive. And so to some of the um, points that Nikita was just making, the bandwidth for the teams that are actually within government that are trying to process and analyze all of that information uh, does become constrained. And so it's, I think, why I spent so much time in my, my previous discussion talking about the need for us to really understand what types of standards are we talking about, because then we can identify who needs to be at the table for which types of conversations to have uh, broad-based discussions about all types of AI in all types of contexts makes it really difficult to get the right stakeholders there. Um, one very um, significant effort that we're trying to make is to ensure inclusion across 
all aspects of civil society. And so something that's been missing from a lot of our um, conversations is Indigenous groups in the Canadian context. And so we're making a concerted effort to ensure that uh, voices from the most impacted uh, populations uh, in Canada are being uh, not only brought in, uh, but again, really understand in the harms that can come from these AI systems to try and find appropriate ways that standards can help to mitigate those. Great, thank you, Ashley. And uh, over to you, Vansi, for your views on stakeholder participation. Um, yeah, it's definitely a very complex space. Um, Singapore is a small country, uh, smallest here, I think, amongst every, everybody on the panel. Um, and we have also limited resources. Um, so one of the things that we need to do is then make sure that we, uh, we, we focus our resources in areas where we can contribute to the global conversation, because there are many, uh, there's, there's lots going on at the, in the standard space. Um, and so we want to make sure that um, what we do makes sense in, you know, in, in the grand scheme of things. Um, and that's why we are very targeted in terms of where we are, where we want to develop and um, spend effort. Um, because a lot of the things that's already happening internationally, we could adopt. And where we think there are gaps, then we want to make sure that we have to plug. Um, and that's why um, we look at, you know, actually tooling, testing, um, as a as as an as an emphasis uh, in terms of where we want to put our resources. Uh, that's not to say that other areas are not important. It's just where we think, oh, there's a gap, and this is where Singapore can help, right? Um, that's and that's how we started the AI Verify. Um, in terms of getting more involvement, I think we definitely are very active in making sure that um, what we do is not just a government kind of perspective. Um, we are very active in engaging industry, um, companies, large and small companies that operate globally, that operate domestically in Singapore, um, to make sure that um, their voices or their input um, can be incorporated. Um, everyone or all organizations can participate in, let's say, the AI Verify Foundation, um, it's open source anyway. And we're trying to make that uh, mechanism for any, any organization that's interested, even if you're very small, from not from Singapore, um, it is a platform that you can, you can um, contribute um, on. Um, and then from there, then we take some of the work that's being done at Verify Foundation, rationalize it at the national level in Singapore, and then, then to see how we can then support that more globally across in, in other platforms, whether it's the OECD, um, GP, or um, ISO, um, or other um, multilateral platforms. Thanks. Right, thank you, Vansi. And over to you, Aurelie, for your take on stakeholder inclusion. Thank you, Florence. So, Australia, as a small yet powerful delegation, so uh, um, if you have a small delegation, that should not stop you from being involved in, in the standards. Um, we, um, most of the experts were new to standards, so uh, it took a, a little bit of uh, adaptation uh, when we uh, got started back in 2018. Um, one thing I'd, um, I'd like to highlight is, as I say, um, we, we worked with other small countries to ensure that the mechanisms that are in place are actually fitting uh, for, um, for our size. Um, and uh, when you have many experts, um, you cannot have them uh, in all the different um, meeting at all times. So we've worked very uh, closely with others to make this process manageable. Um, we, Australia is actually leading uh, one uh, of the work item on AI and sustainability. Um, so, so for us, it's really a great way to look at the key uh, element that we have in Australia and how we want to lead them uh, overseas. Um, the, of course, we have the, the resource challenge and the time challenge from a resource perspective. We're very lucky uh, to help with uh, um, organizations that is a non-for-profit or smaller business. Um, we have uh, help from the government that just allow us to participate and uh, travel uh, as volunteers um, in to, in, and attend the ISO plenary that's coming actually in Vienna 
next week. Um, one uh, challenge also is that we've been um, working very closely with Sara and the National AI Center is really, if you have not participated in the development of those standards, sometimes um, it's hard to get the context around um, those documents when they're written. So, so our experts have uh, worked really hard to start developing some white papers um, on giving the background between 42,001 or some of the bias standards or the sustainability standards that we are developing and how they're building into practice. Um, one, one challenge remain, obviously, it's, um, it's for SMEs. Um, the uptake standards are often uptake by broader organizations. So how do we make this more fit for purpose for SME? How do we make it easier accessible for SMEs? That's conversation that are ongoing and with, on which we are working uh, very closely. Great, thank you, Aurelie. Now we have already um, we're already approaching sort of almost you know getting close to the hour, um, so we don't have much time left. There's lots more that I that I'd like to ask, but I also would like to make sure that we get a chance you know to get contributions from the audience. So I think we'll briefly pause the panel, and and see um, who might like to come in. I think there's a co one contribution in the back and also Holly uh, in the front. So. If the two of you would like to come in, and then if anyone online would like to come in, you will be able to uh, actually speak. So please do raise your hand if you'd like to um, contribute. Um, but yeah, please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Walter Natris. I'm the coordinator of the Internet Standards Security and Safety Coalition here at the, at the IGF, the Dynamic Coalition. I'd like to make two comments. What I notice is that what we're talking about here are all more or less government uh, accepted in the standards institutions like ISO, CENELEC, etc. What I've noticed in the research that we've been doing on internet standards is that in the technical community, quite often all sort of standards are made as well. And we found that they're almost for 100% not accepted in government policies. So if that, if that, I don't know, but if that is the case with AI as well, then you have two separate bodies creating standards, which one may be official at some point and the other one, ones who make the internet run and AI run on the internet are not addressed in any way. So my suggestion would be to reach out to the technical community and see what is being done in the IETF or IEEE, etc. My second comment is more strategic a little bit. I hear these fantastic initiatives that you're presenting and we have probably had 19 other AI sessions here at the IGF. So what is going to come out of this session? Ideally, it would have been some sort, like we can't call it the declaration in the IGF context, I know, but what you're doing should be the main message coming out of the AI track here at the IGF. And probably now we all go home with a little report somewhere stuck on a fairly obscure website. So when you talk about the MAG, Perhaps if you want to influence it, that next year there will be some sort of a declaration on this because what you're presenting here is the future. And it's a shame if we go home without the world hearing about it. So thank you. Thank you very much for that. And yeah, thanks for the, you know, um, encouraging words in, in your second comment. To the first comment, just to briefly say, I think, you know, the the point you raise is a really important one, and we're we focused in the presentation on you know the organisations that we mentioned, but we very much are aware of the wider landscape, you know, including standards developed in IETF and, and others, and so it's really part of the mission of what we're trying to achieve is to make those connections and provide the full full picture. Um, so thanks for bringing that in, um, Holly. Please. Hi, I'm Holly Hamlet with Consumers International. We're a membership organization of consumer groups around the world. And um, I wanted to start by saying I think this is a really great initiative. I think it's going to be really helpful to have that multi-stakeholder approach and it's really vital to get consumer organizations and larger civil society involved in these processes. Um, but I wanted to briefly comment on just the value of consumer organizations joining the AI, sta AI Standards Hub 
what we can bring and then commenting on what the AI, AI standards hub will give to us and how it will be helpful. Um, so the value of consumer groups and consumers international especially is that we can play this role in ensuring that AI is developed ethically and responsibly because we represent the interests of consumers who are the end users of the products and services. And we bring this unique perspective that a lot of consumer organizations uh, are uh, complaint mechanisms uh, for consumers, so they have uh, direct insight into how they're using the products and services, how it's impacting them. They do a lot of product and service testing themselves, so they have information on whether it's compliant with consumer protection regulations that are existing, whether it needs to be uh, enhanced in some way with standards. So what I'm saying here is that consumer organizations have a lot of data that can help standards be supported with evidence and make sure that it is reflective of consumer interests. And the things that consumer organizations can bring to this space uh, we have those insights to make sure that standards are gr uh, grounded in ground level realities uh, to reflect how the technology will impact consumers. We can bring a global perspective, not just Consumers International, but our whole membership uh, base. We have around 200 consumer organizations in around 100 countries. This is very, very global, very diverse and representative. And bringing in these voices is absolutely vital. We can help ensure that standards are designed to protect consumer interests from the outset. It's a huge problem with regulation, standards, policies, that consumer interests are brought in at the end and they're an afterthought a lot of the time, which leads to further harm for consumers. But bringing them into the discussions to begin with is a really great way to make sure that not only is everything compliant with existing regulation, but that it is uh, sustainable in the long run because we can consider what impacts will uh, will it will have on consumers, mitigate the risks and ensure that everyone enjoys the benefits. We can provide feedback on draft standards to make sure they're clear, concise and easy to implement. And this isn't just generally to businesses, governments, anyone that it applies to, but this is to consumers themselves. If consumers are aware of the standards, they're able to exercise their consumer rights, they're able to engage with technology a lot better. So it's really good to make sure that they are translated into very consumer-friendly language. And that's something that consumer organizations can absolutely help with. And then final way that we can help is to promote the adoption of standards by consumer organizations, businesses, governments. We are fairly connected in who we work with and it's um, a big benefit of working with consumer organizations that we're able to say, this is consumer friendly, we support this. Uh, and it can help push that forward as a standard. But the AI, st AI Standards Hub for us is gonna be incredibly helpful. Florian mentioned absolutely in the PowerPoint that there are two very sizable challenges that consumer organizations face, or civil society generally. One being that we are not often welcome in the spaces. It's very difficult to get into the standardization process. Um, this is know, largely due to the fact that the, uh, sorry, the um, process is dominated by industry experts or technical representatives, and civil society isn't generally there, which then leads to the consumer interest being the afterthought, which is something that absolutely needs to be avoided. And then secondly, is the capacity building. Some of our organizations, our members are wonderful in the digital space. They're very, very clued up on it. So other members are experts in consumer protection and consumer protection only. It's very difficult uh, for consumer organizations traditionally being underfunded, not very well resourced, and not uh, experts in everything to then try and cover the vast scope of all digital issues, particularly complex emerging technologies like AI. So something like the community and capacity building of the hub is gonna be beyond helpful. This isn't something that we offer our members, so it's gonna be helpful to us as an organization and to our members through that as well to make sure that they can contribute not only to our work, but to work globally, internationally, to make sure that there's 
the space there, the capacity there to be able to do that. And then I'll end on one final note, because I know I'm taking up a lot of time here, but it's very important to consider that consumer organizations are not a monolithic group. We represent a diverse range of views and interests, and it's important to ensure that there's broad representation of all consumer voices in AI, AI standardization. And one way to make this easier is for the consumers themselves to understand the process, to contribute to it, and to know what is going on and how they can be a part of this. So we need to develop these user-friendly tools. We need to have the resources and help consumers learn about AI, AI standards, and provide their feedback consistently. Thanks. Great, thank you very much for that. And um, you know, we'll be very interested to, to explore with you how, how we can work together, um, address those, those uh, challenges. And it's particularly you know, great to, to hear about and, and consider your role as an international um, organization that brings together consumer organizations from, from around the world. Now, we've almost run out of time. I'd like to use you know, the last couple of minutes, um, if we can, for a short, a very quick round across the panel um, and, invi and invite each of you um, to sort of share your final reflections. And perhaps in particular, if you have any points, you know, maybe your sort of top three priorities for international collaboration, if you bring it back to that theme, and also going back to the earlier question of, or the comment to encourage us to think about tangible you know, outcomes from this session. Um, so it'd be great to hear from each of you if, if you have any uh, such thoughts. You know, what are the top two or three priorities for international collaboration in this space? And we'll start with you, Nikita. Sure, thanks, Florian. And, and I'll be brief as well as conscious of time. Um, I think from our perspective, um, our top international uh, priorities is um, collaboration and working with um, different stakeholder groups in different countries so that includes sort of um, from UK government bilaterally and multilaterally multilaterally with government groups who promote the role of standards um, within the wider AI governance framework as a tool for trustworthy AI um, I think also through um, you know mechanisms such as the AI standards hub it's joining up with um, uh, equivalents um, internationally, not just sort of government, but different consume, uh, different stakeholder groups such as consumer groups, um, industry as well, to really better understand what are the, the barriers and what are the challenges in the standards ecosystem and how can we work together to, to break through um, and make the standards environment for all, um, not just the few. And I think it's a continuation of sort of tangible um, outcomes following um, kind of discussions and collaborations in this space, um, really emphasizing sort of research um, on standards and um, re UK um, research, but also working with international partners to, to understand the broad issues um, that we've discussed today as well. As well, thanks. Thank you, Nikita. Um, Ashley, over to you. Thanks. I'll keep it short. Uh, I think that understanding what's already happening in the space so that we're not reinventing in any country is really important. And so an international exercise, whether that's through OECD or another forum like IGF to do almost a mapping of the standards that are taking place where so that um, we can look to understand not only what's being done, but then what types of harmonization efforts are required um, is something that I'd really love to be able to see. And then um, again, I can't stress this enough, AI is not one monolithic thing. And so really starting to break down the different types of uses and then therefore harms that are attributed from these systems and those specific uses and then getting the right people right stakeholders around the table to be able to have those dialogues that recognizing ai crosses or transcends borders uh, i think is going to be important dialogues for us to have in the years to come great thank you ashley and Van C, over to you thanks uh, i'll also keep it short i think um for us it's really important that there's no um, fragmentization of AI standards and no AI um, regulations. So we are working, we've been working very hard over the last few years and we'll continue to do that to um, partner with um, countries as well as uh, participate actively in multilateral um, platforms to um, try and hopefully um, drive towards, you know, at least work together towards some kind of um, harmonized or aligned or interoperable um, standards for AI. Um, I mean, we're starting to see a lot of countries coming up with their own, you know, sort of requirements. Um, in Singapore, we're, we're doing it both within our region. In ASEAN, we 
we we support um, the development of a consistent ASEAN guide um, for AI, a responsible AI implementation. Um, but at the same time, also then beyond ASEAN, then we're also active um, globally. Thanks. Great, thank you. Aurelie. Thank you. So following on one uh, point, I think what's important to know is it's actually good to see different uh, practices and different uh, regulatory initiative. What standards do is interoperability. That's why we are doing standards. That's why we are involved in standards because of interoperability. It's not um, about unification. It's about harmonization. So what the, the key point that we made in some of our workshop at the APEX on, it's it's allowing to have diverse views, but actually making sense of each of these view and the standards is a thread that brings all, all those view and perspective together. So because from an Australian perspective, what the three things that we focus on is making sure we use AI responsibly and we can scale it. To do that, we need interoperability. And that's why we use standards, not only as a way to check international best practice, but also to learn from international best practice. Because when you have um, 100 experts from government, academia, and industry together in the room that are discussing um, the best practice for responsible AI, this is a great resource to inform local policy, but also um, uh, develop our expert and grow the industry. Thank you. Great. I mean, in many ways, we've only sort of scratched the surface, um, you know, during the last uh, 90 minutes. We could easily spend another hour or two discussing. Um, but um, I'm glad we, you know, got as far as we did. And I, I do hope that, you know, what we were able to cover um, sort of uh, spiked your interest uh, for those of you who, who might be entering the standard space uh, without, without a background, for those of you who are already involved. Um, you know, to, to sort of get those different perspectives from around the world. And for all of you, you know, going back to sort of the motivation for the session and the discussion around inter international collaboration, we'd be really, really uh, interested um, if, you, if you have ideas on collaborating and, and um, you know, joining up initiatives um, from across, across the fields that you're working in. We'd be really interested and would love to hear from you. So please do reach out to us if, if you have ideas um, for working together. Um, I think that's the main message to end on. Um, and other than that, all that is left to do, I think, is to thank everyone, thank our esteemed panelists. Thank you for joining online across different time zones. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you, Nikita, for being in the room. And thank you to my colleagues, um, Matilda and Sunny, uh, for being on the stage. So thank you, everyone. And um, let's hope that you know, there'll be a continuation of these discussions and, and uh, yeah, to see many of you again in one way or another. Thank you. <laughs>